If you haven't already given praise to the Lord, why don't you lift up your voice right now and begin to praise the King of Kings. Glory to God. Praise God. I'd like to welcome all of our guests here in the house of the Lord tonight. You've come to a great place. Hallelujah. And don't look at these up here that are up here worshiping as if it was a str some strange thing. Praise God. Because Jesus began to speak about it. He said, to whom was forgiven much, he loveth much. You don't know where they came from. Hallelujah. You don't know where they've been. Hallelujah. But they've been forgiven a lot. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know what? We ought, to just, we ought to worship Jesus more than they worship him out in the football stadiums. They got all crazy and they paint up their faces. They wear big old pieces of cheese on their head. Hallelujah. But we apostolics. Hallelujah. We get a little bit crazy in the house. Hallelujah. Because we've been forgiven much. And we love much. Hallelujah. Praise God. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost in this place tonight. I feel like God wants to forgive somebody of their sins tonight. I feel like he wants to fill someone with the great gift of the Holy Ghost in this place tonight. Hallelujah. Let's create an atmosphere of praise. Hallelujah. Come on, let's lift up our voices one more time as we worship him. Oh, come on, that's about half of you. Come on. Why don't we lift up our voices? Why don't we lift up our praises unto him and thank him for what he's going to do? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. I remember who we were supposed to pray for earlier. Praise God. Sister Claudia needs a healing tonight as well. Hallelujah. So let's remember all these prayer requests tonight as we praise him tonight. Hallelujah, Jesus. Lord God, we're asking Lord, one more time, Lord God, for your healing virtue to go forth, Lord God. You promised, Lord, that, that no disease would come nigh our dwelling, Lord God. We're just standing upon your word, Lord Jesus. We're asking, Lord God, just for you just to fulfill your word, Lord God, because we know that in you is truth, Lord God, and you cannot lie. We ask in Jesus Christ's name. And the church said, in Jesus' name. Oh, let's praise him. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's, it's my pleasure here tonight to bring up our preacher here tonight, Brother Kyle Charles. If I could preach about 1% as good as he could, I, would, I think I would be pretty happy. Hallelujah. But I'm so glad we have him here to, to preach to us the Word of God. Hallelujah. He studies the word. Hallelujah. He's been a lot of our mentors over the last few years. Hallelujah. And I think that he does deserve honor in this place. And I'm glad that I can call him my friend. I'm glad that I can call him when I need help. Hallelujah. And I'm so glad that he's in the church and that he's my brother-in-law. Couldn't ask for a better one. <laughs> Hallelujah. So everyone, let's say, preach to me, Brother Kyle. Hallelujah. Let's go ahead and give Jesus a round of applause in this place tonight. Hallelujah. If you feel that he's worthy, why don't you give him a high praise? Come on. From your heart, from the depths of your soul. If it's for me, but it's for Jesus that we're here tonight.
serve a great God and Savior in this place. earlier this is a continuance of what brother seen preached this morning because it is imperative that we as ministers of the gospel preach the word we have to preach Christ and we have to preach the cross Colossians 2 and 8 says beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men after the redudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. That is of your heart. When he comes in and he begins to tear away that old heart. And he creates a new heart within you. 
and you are putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ and buried with him in baptism. Wherein ye also are risen with him through faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened or made alive together with him, having forgiven all trespasses. You look at me and you say, why are you reading that? Because if we don't preach the word, if we don't preach the cross, if we don't preach salvation, you can never find newness of life in Christ Jesus. It talks a lot about circumcision of the heart and the old man. It is the cutting away of all that used to be to reveal something that is new within. The only thing that does this is the preaching of the word. Well, if I don't resonate with many of y'all, I'll just start reading again. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the rudiments of this world and not after Christ. The rudiments of this world, the philosophies of this world, the things of this world that they want to hold up and say it's greater than the blood of Christ and it's greater than the power of Christ. But we come to this desk and we say, no, not in this church. We understand the power of Christ and him crucified. The purpose of Jesus Christ was to set the example of the apostle. You look all the way back to the book of Genesis as God himself gave example and foreshadowing of the first apostle as he began to walk in the garden and he began to seek the sinner. Adam, where are you? I know you've sinned. Oh, but that ain't the end. Don't hide yourself from me. Don't forget our friendship. If I can seek and save that which is lost right now, there's hope for eternity. There's hope for mankind. And there's a promise for tomorrow. Luke 19 and 10. You see, as he continues to set the example of the apostle, if nothing is more exemplary of Jesus was God manifest in the flesh, this scripture in Luke lays it out for you because he begins to represent what he was in the garden. It says, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. If we don't seek and save the lost, then we are not fulfilling the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some people say, why do you have to seek the lost? We're all saved by grace. According to my scripture, we have to go out and we have to find them in the highways, in the byways, in any place that we can reach them. It doesn't matter their status or their situation. If they haven't been washed in the blood of Jesus, if they haven't repented of their sins, and if they haven't found the power of the Spirit of God in their life, they are still a sinner. I'll say it again. If you don't know the gospel in your life, I'm here to preach to you tonight. You might be dead in trespasses and sin, but God has drawn you to this place to preach the gospel into your soul tonight. His gospel is a gospel of change and salvation. He doesn't save you in your sins. He's here to save his people from their sins. When we begin to look at the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have to preach who Jesus was and what he did. Mark 16 and 15, the Bible says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's not up to us who we preach it to. It's not up to us who we reach for. But the Great Commission to each and every one of us is, Go into the world. Stop preaching for your brothers and sisters in the house and go out and find a lost sheep. Find somebody that needs direction and say, come on to the house of God. Let me take you to a place where I can introduce you to our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We
we began to study the parable of the sower. And it doesn't say that the sower was choosy in where or who he sowed the seed to. If it's stony, we sow the seed of the gospel. If it's thorny, we sow the seed of the gospel. If we see the birds of this world, the fowl of the air, watching to pluck up the seeds, we sow the seeds of the gospel. Because in doing so, the chance of it landing on fertile ground is increased. And it only takes one person who lets that seed of the gospel get deep within their soul. And they say, I see the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Reminds me of the scripture where it says many are called, but few are chosen. Because his message is to all. But it is up to all to respond to the message. When we sow, we pray that God will supply the increase. That God will anoint the seed of the gospel. That it would bear fruit, meat for repentance. The power of the gospel, when Mark began penning his book, we see that he labels it the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was laying out a precedent that is to be established for all the gospels. That what is in this book is the telling of the story of who Jesus was and what he did for humanity. It's the power of the gospel that saves the template for us to be living epistles according to the gospels of Jesus Christ. To do that, we have to walk as he walked. We have to speak as he spake. And we have to reach for people as he reached for us. A lot of times in this world, people would rather focus on everything else because it's easier than recognizing they don't represent Jesus. I hate the definition and the label assigned to charismatic. The word charismatic means God lover. And my Bible says, he that heareth and doeth the will of my Father, these are the sons of God. If you love me, keep my commandments. Oh, I know I'm not going crazy right now, but I'm preaching the gospel. It's easier to preach philosophies, thoughts, and ideas than crucifying your pride and your own internalized ideas. It's easier to preach your vanity than it is to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he will exalt you in due season. It's easier to preach your confirmation biases than it is to get in the word of God and study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Preaching is confrontational. It comes in face to face with who you are. And it says if you don't meet the standards of the word, you have to align yourself with the word. It cuts past every facade. That's why it is called the sword of the spirit. The sword of the word of God because it cuts into the very bone and the marrow of who you are. It says to the soul and the spirit. I've preached this before. The word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ can tell the difference between emotionalism. If you want to get up here and wave your arms and act all crazy, I guarantee you I can find 75,000 fans in any stadium in this world right now doing the exact same thing. But when you take a moment to recognize the power of the gospel of the cross of Jesus Christ, and you say, oh my God, he did something great for me. 
it becomes more than just emotions. And it comes into a place and time with your spirit where the world fades away. And you begin to worship and humble yourself and say, oh God, I can never repay you for all that you have done for me. Cuts to the center of who you are. That's why many people don't enjoy preaching. They don't want to come to church because they don't want to face who they really are. But a true apostle comes in and says, oh, change me, Jesus. Take me as clay and remold me. Make me again, oh God. Break me, oh God. Do whatever you have to do, oh God, to make me in your image that I can be a vessel of honor for your gospel. People of this world would rather argue about the minutia than submit themselves to the cross and the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's funny to me that we see so many people that are willing to debate with sinners and with people that aren't of like precious faith about the word of God. That is not what Jesus told us to do. If, in the fact, if you look at what Jesus did, the only time he debated people was people that were saved. When he went to them and said, hey, your philosophy is getting in the way of your religion, brother. Your religion's getting in the way of your walk with God, brother. Your idea of the law is getting in the way of your blessing and the anointing of understanding the power of who walks with you. You say, well, did he argue with anybody else? The devil. If you don't like it, I don't really care. It's in the word. But the only other time he looked at him and said, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He was setting precedent. When you're reaching for the lost, don't get tied up in the minutia or the basics or the things of this world. Don't get tied up in the philosophies or the thoughts or the beliefs of this world. If you're a sinner and you're here tonight, don't get tied up with the things of this world when we begin to preach. But say, hey, is he preaching Jesus? Is he preaching Christ crucified? I'm going to get there, I promise. Religious people not doing the will of his father. He walked into the temple. Sometimes we as saints of God need to have our tables flipped over and have a finger pointed in our face. And saying you aren't where you need to be in God. I'm here to do the will of my Father. Are you doing the will of your Father who is in heaven? It's that confrontation of the gospel. We need to stick to the gospel. We don't need to get upset. We don't need to fall away. We don't need to be offended at these things. We have to recognize it's the gospel that saves it's the gospel that changes us from who we used to be into who we need to be. The scripture we read earlier, it is the power of God unto salvation. A lot of times the reason we do this is it's easier to live in what we know. It's easier to live in what's convenient for me. easier to live in what's comfortable it doesn't require me to change it doesn't require me to get up and do anything it doesn't require me to confront who I am right now it doesn't require me to take action about my salvation it takes relationship and effort to believe even when you don't see it it takes relationship to trust in him when you don't feel him. 
It takes power to take action when you don't see the results of what's coming. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, the Bible says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek. He's saying in this scripture, if you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you will be saved. You say, all I have to do is believe. That's a start. That's where you got to start. First, you must believe that he is. And he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. It's an action word because I've got to start by believing he is. But then I've got to seek him that I might find him while he may be found. Verse 17 says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. It's that faith walk we're talking about. When you trust in the gospel of Jesus Christ and you step out in faith and say, I'm going to be like Jesus. He is going to reveal the next step that you have to take. You say, I don't even know where to start. Why don't you just step out of your pew? Why don't you take that first step and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to find out what the gospel says for my life. The gospel takes faith. The old reciprocal nature of God. That if you take the first step, he'll take the second. You see, in the parable of the young man who had thrown away his inheritance. He was a prodigal. He'd thrown away the love of his father's house. And he'd went off to live riotously. He was having a party. Pleasure's a sinner for a season. Don't worry, bub. You're enjoying it right now. But there's going to come a time where you're eating with the pigs if you don't watch it. But the moment that he made up in his heart, I know who my father is. And he began to make his way to his father's house. And while his father seen him afar off, it said he began to run to him. You want Jesus to run to you tonight. All you got to do is take that first step and say, oh, Jesus, I want to come home. Oh, I need a father. I need you to be the father in my life. I need you to show me your power, Jesus. And as you begin to make those steps towards God, that reciprocal nature of God kicks in. And he says, oh, I see my baby. I reach for them. I call them with a purpose. And I'm going to get them and bring them into my house. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6. Incredible scripture. It says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ. This most important of scriptures that we read says, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you. Then that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. You say, what are you talking about? Where do we have that preaching? Well, it's all in your word right here. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that ye have received, let him be accursed. It is important that we don't change the gospel 
of Jesus Christ. We can't change it to fit people's lifestyle. We can't change it to fit their desires. We can't change it to fit their wants and their wills and their ways. Because it is not a gospel of conformity. But it is a gospel of change. And the word is not changing. It is forever settled in heaven. It is there for us to look and to say, I have to change. You have to stay in the word to stay in the gospel. If you want to stay in grace, stay in the word. If you want to stay in favor, stay in the word. Because anything less than that, and you just heard it, the judgment of God will be upon your life. So what is the gospel? 1 Corinthians 1.23 But we preach Christ crucified. That's a start. Unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. It's even how it is today when we begin to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are people that are sitting under the sound of my voice right now that are saying it's foolishness. It's craziness. It's a stumbling block because the Greeks didn't want to change who they were. They wanted to stay doing what they had been doing and following the ways of their philosophers. You hear about the Greek philosophers. It's because they had so much wisdom that they couldn't see Jesus through all the power of wisdom that they carried. And when he says this, it is because the crucifixion of Jesus is the very cornerstone of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, the Bible says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which ye also have received, and wherein ye stand, by which ye also are saved, if you keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless ye believe, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. I was teaching in my class, I don't know, been a couple weeks ago, maybe a week ago, two weeks, I don't know. I've slept since then. And I asked them, what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? You hear that. It's the death, the burial. And the resurrection. Why is that so important? Because we have to die out just like he did. Our death starts with repentance in an altar. Where we say, oh God, I'm sorry for all that I've done against your word. And against your power and your will. And you die out completely to sin. You do a 180. Repentance means an about face. I'm walking one direction and I'm about to do an about face in the name of Jesus. Literally in the name of Jesus. The second is the burial. When somebody dies, you bury them. Like this young man sitting on the back pew tonight. I'm so happy when you said you're getting baptized tonight. He's going to be baptized and buried. Oh, you think this is something. You ain't seen nothing yet, Bubba. All of heaven rejoices over one sinner that repents. When somebody gets baptized and repents of their sins, it's time to party. And there ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party. Because a Holy Ghost party don't stop. But when you die, you got to be buried. So when you repent, you got to be buried. We got to get rid of that old man. We got to put him down. If you understand the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you understand that when he was buried, 
he went into that grave marred and broken and scarred and toe up from the flow up. And when he came out, they didn't even recognize him. He had changed. They were like, is this Jesus? Who is this stranger? And they were afraid. Who is this man? I don't know him. He doesn't look the same as he used to. He doesn't walk the same. He isn't all messed up and beat up and scarred and broken anymore. The last time I seen him, he was dead in trespasses and sins. And he was shaping in iniquity. I'm talking about you right now. But when you're buried in baptism and you come out, your neighbor looks at you and says, they ain't smoking on the back porch no more. They ain't cussing. They ain't chewing. They ain't going to the honky tonk. They're a new creature in Christ Jesus. That's the resurrection. When you look all the way back to the creation of man. I know this is basic for all y'all. I'm going to keep preaching it anyways. You look at Jesus as he died and rose again. But he did a little something in that three days. He went down and he conquered death, hell, and the grave. That's why we don't die. That's why when you see it, he says, you go to rest until I call you again. Because you're not dead anymore with the weight of those sins. Oh, you don't believe me? When Jesus died and the veil was rent, it says all the saints of old crawled up out of their graves. Uh, and they began to walk and talk and prophesy. And they began to say, oh, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? You thought you beat me, devil. You thought you did it because the blood had it come. But he died so I could rise again. That's some good preaching right there. I don't care who's preaching it. I know I didn't do it as good as some people can. But it's fun. But anyways, all the way back to the garden. That resurrection you see. Why is it so important to go back to the garden? It's foreshadowing. Jesus looked at Adam. And he created him out of the dust of the earth. And he says, he's almost there. Man, I thought this was going to be short. He looked at Adam and he says... I just need something a little bit more. And he breathed the breath of God into him. And he became a living creature. No, 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 no. I'm not done yet. No, no, no. We all, oh, yes, he became a living creature. No. But then Adam messed up. He walked with Jesus. He talked with God. He was, he was walking in the garden, and they developed friendship and relationship, and they began to love each other, and they began to talk to each other about everything. And Adam, oh, they were there a long time, Bubba, because he was human, and he named every creature on this earth. He was the father of all living things. That was his job. And they walked, and they talked to each other, and they grew to know each other. I guarantee you there's no one else that's ever known God like Adam did. And Adam sinned. And then God started working through the garden. Where's my coffee, buddy? I feel like there's something between me and you right now. I can't f I don't feel you anymore, Adam. I don't feel as close to you as I used to, Adam. Where are you at right now, Adam? Oh, 
Why, why is that spirit not connecting with my spirit? That, that breath of God is not. Because in a moment, sin had destroyed that spirit connection. So for 4,000 years, man was forced to live under the promise of the blood of goats and rams and oxen. And they walked in hope of resurrection. But there was always a missing piece. There was always that part of them that was looking for that connection in the garden. Oh, and when they'd pray and they'd call out for God, it's because they could never feel him and they didn't know where he was. resurrected with him. He breathed that breath of life back into us that was missing from the garden. And we become a living creature in Christ Jesus. And we start having talks with Jesus again. And we start walking with Jesus again. And we start speaking the same language as Jesus again. And we start doing like Jesus wants us to do again. And we have remission of sins again. And we feel power with God again. That's why I don't get excited about the breath of God in the garden. Again, I could preach on that literally probably every single service I preach for the rest of my life. There is so much tied into that one verse of Scripture. But because of man's failures, they separated themselves from God. How do you know you've received the Spirit of God? You will speak with tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. You say, why is that important? Because this world isn't my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere. Ab- yeah. And I hear heaven calling me. And the language of heaven isn't the language of this earth. Because when I get to heaven, I have to be able to talk to my brothers and sisters of all nations and creeds and colors and Oh, if you think that this is just a white religion or a black religion or a Jewish religion or a Hispanic religion. No, brother, we don't separate on Sundays and commit the sin, the original sin of Babel. We say, hey, we're all going to speak the same language. We're all going to praise the same God. We're all going to walk in the same hope of our calling because when I get over there, my God. I'm going to be like him. And if you can't be like him down here, you ain't going to make it over there. Now, I would pull up my pant legs because it's getting deep. And it's tight, but it's right. And if you feel angry right now, that's the gospel attacking your belief system. Preach the word. Be instant in season. Out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For there will come to a time when they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Uh, tickle my ear, preacher. Tell me what I want to hear. Tell me what I want to feel. But the gospel says, no, 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 no. There was a man called Christ Jesus. And he came and he came to die for everybody. Sorry, I don't have all the scriptures for that. I, I, I gave you that list. It didn't include half the scriptures I'm giving right now. But it is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. We have to walk in the spirit because it is the spirit that gives us life. The important revelation is the power of Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. We must know him not only in the gospel of his life, but in the power of his crucifixion. This is where I want to tie back into what Brother Sneed preached this morning. For all of you that were waiting for that to happen. 
Philippians 3 and 18. Our text tonight says, For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. In this scripture, it was talking about a new group of preachers, people that had started going around, and they were preaching the gospel of Jesus. They were. They were saying, man, Jesus was a good old boy. He came down to earth. Man, he showed us all these miracles. He showed us cool ways to live. He said, love your brother, man. You should love your brother. You should love your neighbor. You should pray for them to hate you. You should pray for them to despitefully use you. Well, as Christians, we like to get bent out of shape and call persecution anytime something bad happens every day. I hate to tell you, bub, persecution hasn't even started. We're like in the first chapter of Revelation right now. Let's go about five more chapters in. We're going to have a real fun time tonight. Just kidding. I ain't preaching on that. But they were preaching about all of the words of Jesus and the miracles of Jesus. And their churches had just the right music. And the worship looked all right. But it was a gospel without the cross. They refused to preach the crucifixion of Jesus. Because we understand the crucifixion of Jesus is where we begin to lay ourselves. We are buried with him. But if we're going to be buried, we have to die with him. And nobody wants to talk about crucifying their flesh. It was a message without the blood and the pain and the suffering. It was a passionless gospel. It was a passive gospel. They passively, oh, you all can be saved. Just accept the Lord Jesus. That's what they were saying. Love your brother. Love your sister. Is that right? You know, the crazy thing about heresy is it's a finely woven tapestry. Literally comes from an old Greek word where they would create these tapestries and silk was so valuable. And they would create an entire tapestry of the cheap silks. But certain colors were expensive. The purples, the blues, because they were the color of royalty. And they would weave into that tapestry thread that was not silk. And so when you looked at it, it looked like the real thing. But there was just enough false doctrine. And all it takes is a little leaven to leaven the whole lump. It was a passive gospel. When you study it out, they were preaching thought-provoking messages. I've seen preachers on Instagram, and I follow these musicians that have followed me from all over the country. I don't know how they know who I am. They don't know who I am. I'm not even going to pretend. I don't know. They just, I see it. I, I follow them back. I'm like, whatever. And I see these pastors, man, and I, I see some things on there. I'm like, man, that is some really good stuff. That guy is preaching. Man, he sounds, man, I want to listen to more of his preaching. Oh, yeah. It sounds close to what my pastor is preaching. And then just like Jesus, not Jesus the man, Jesus the play. Everybody that knows what I'm about to go with, say amen. Okay, I know more of you know where I'm going with this. Say amen. 
Man, they had it all right. And we're sitting there waiting for the promise of the Father. Oh, it's coming not many days hence. But you don't have to receive the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. No, 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 no. You just believe on the Lord Jesus and accept him into your heart. If you want to come on up to the front right now. <laughs> and everybody collective gasps. Oh, they were so close. We thought we had so many brothers and sisters at Branson. <laughs> But it's heresy. And it's deceiving the whole world. It was worship without the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. What we have to understand is the cross is essential to who Jesus was. The cross is a place that every single one of us has to go. It's where we have to take people that we meet, that we want to see saved. It's to the foot of the gory, bloody, marred, dirty cross. It was a horrible cross where he hung in suffering and anguish. Oh, yeah, he hung there in loneliness and rejection. You think you've been lonely. You think you've dealt with rejection. You think you've been hurt by the world. You think you've had people spit on you and lie about you. Oh, you just look to Jesus. He did all of that so he would know our suffering. And through it all, he still bore every one of our sins. And he uttered not a word. Because the whole point of his ministry was the cross. The fulfillment of his prophetic journey through Israel and through history was the cross. The entire point of his life as a man was the cross. I know I'm not yelling and screaming right now. But it was the cross. That he looked to from the foundation of the world. He said he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He looked at that cross and he said, I know there's a time in history where I am going to go and die for every man. First Peter 2 and 22 The Bible says, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth because he was perfect. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When people talked about him and cursed him and were bitter against him as he was being led. He was being led to his execution and people were talking about him still. Oh, even now today, we don't even like to do that. A person, a horrible person could die, and we're like, man, well, he had some good qualities. Like he tied his shoes the right way once or twice. I don't know. I can't think of anything else, but, man, let's find something good to say at his funeral. But Jesus says he's being led to the cross. They're still cursing him. They're still reviling him. They're still calling him names. They're spitting on him. They're hitting him. They are abusing him through his suffering for our sins. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. And when he suffered, he threatened not. But he committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. He knew. And he did it anyways. When you take away the cross, you take away the grace and the suffering of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2 and 24 continues to say, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. When you begin to read that last part of that scripture, it's so powerful because it says, by whose stripes ye 
were healed. You go back to Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied in the future tense, and he said, by whose stripes you are healed. But Peter says, by whose stripes you were healed. What does that mean, Brother Kyle? That when he went to the cross, he healed your infirmities. It's up to you to claim the healing of Jesus Christ. To look to the cross and say, oh, I see the suffering and the anguish and all that you went through for my healing and my salvation. When Jesus went to Calvary, he took away the sins of the world. He died for every man and woman in this place. When you take away the cross, you take away the blood of Jesus Christ. And the power is taken from his blood. When you take away the cross, you take away the healing power of Jesus Christ. When you take away the cross, there is no direct access to God. When you take away the cross, you get rid of reparation of the hearts and the minds of the brokenhearted. Oh, yeah. All the things that they want to preach in all these places or they want to philosophize and they want to bring to people and say, oh, we can help you with that broken situation. And then they don't want to preach the cross of Jesus Christ. When you get rid of the cross, you get rid of the atonement for our sin. What's atonement? Atonement is the payment for our sin. When you get rid of the cross, you get rid of the recovering of sight of the blinded eyes. You want liberty in your life? Go to the cross. That's why denominationalism wants to preach grace as a covering. Oh, yeah, but he dealt unto every man a measure of grace. That's a small amount. But what he gave us that is not finite is his blood. And when you don't preach the cross, you do away with the absolution of sin and the outpouring of blood for every man in your life. The musicians would come. The redeeming blood of Jesus that covers us. And it's easy to say right now, you'll go to the cross with Jesus on this Sunday night. Even unto death, like Peter said. Oh, Jesus, I'll fight for you. I'll go wherever you go, Jesus. But how real is that to you in your life? When Monday morning you face temptation or you face a test or a trial and suddenly that small thing comes and it consumes your focus. And you like finding Peter, you find yourself in Peter, you see yourself denying the power of the cross. Find yourself denying your relationship with Jesus over these small inconveniences. These things that cause fear in our lives. And you forget the promise you made at the altar. But like Jesus told Peter, looked at him when he said that. He said, Peter, when you're converted, strengthen the brethren. You find that moment of crucifixion says all that knew him stood afar off. They did. Everybody that actually knew Jesus and walked with him, they weren't there at the foot of the cross holding on to him. No. They were afar off. Imagine Peter must have been in there. He watched.
and all I have left is my boat, my drunkenness, my old way of life. Jesus told me I was going to be the rock in the corner of the church. walked away from that moment thinking I'll never see Jesus again. So I'm going to go back to what's comfortable. I messed up, so I'm going back to what feels easy. But Jesus is the first of us. He said, I know what I called you to be. wasn't just a story but it was for you Peter I walked with you and I talked with you and I knew you and I loved you and I, I spoke truth into your life and I believed in you Peter and you denied me and even though you denied me I still love you Peter because I died for you I knew you were going to fail Peter but I Somebody to 
pray with. Come on. Now.